Hello, everyone. Um, thanks for coming to this, what is the last session of demystifying medicine. Um, no win areas is not transformed into me. Um, John Hanover again, and I, I've chaired the last two or three. You might think Wynn is playing hooky, but actually he's in Tuscany right now, so I'm sure you all feel very sorry for him. Uh, probably drinking a, a fine wine, perhaps eating some fine cheese. I was there two weeks ago, so I know what, of, of what I'm speaking. Um, so we're, we're going to have some fun today, I hope. Uh, I know many of you are here maybe for the first time for this session, uh, and we, we have, uh, we're blessed here with, with two real leaders uh, to help me discuss this problem of, of the future of biomedical sciences. Um, uh, Dr. Gallen, uh, and, and he'll be telling you about clinical opportunities and, and giving his, his perspective on um, the evolving role of, of uh, scientists and, and clinical scientists in particular. And then uh, really pleased to, to share the podium with Jonathan Lorsch um, and, uh, and GMS, who's going to give us a slightly different perspective on the basic science components. So, so, and I want you to ask questions freely and stop us if we're unclear, and um, and and answer any burning questions that you might be too shy to ask in another format. Okay, um, and if we're feeling up to it in about ten minutes, I'm going to do a little role playing. So, if, I want you to think about whether you're brave enough to be a department chair, because I'm going to ask you to be a department chair. Anyone who wants to be a department chair for a day and ask a lowly postdoc, me, some tough questions. Think about it if you want to do that, okay? And if you don't, I'll, I'll play both roles, okay? <clears throat> Believe me, I do that on a daily basis. Okay, so, um, so you may wonder, what, this guy's really gone, right? He's gone. We're talking about biomedical science. Why is he showing a picture of a man surfing? In this, one of the largest surfs in the world. Anyone tell me where this is taken? Uh, yeah, uh, close, close. Thanks, John. Uh, this is actually on the north shore of Hawaii, Waimea, which was where my father-in-law, uh, Howard Sato, was born. Uh, just under a, a shaved ice, very famous shaved ice uh, palace, as it's called. Um, he grew up with surfing, and it's always been my dream to be a surfer, okay? Um, now, you may say, I don't know what surfing has to do with science. But what I want to do in the, in the next few minutes is point out why I think, in some ways, surfing is a very good metaphor for the business we do, biomedical research. Okay? So is anyone inspired by the fact that this man has, or, or this woman uh, has the courage to stand in a wave that could crush anyone and have the courage to learn this very intricate talent where there is absolutely no obvious no obvious reason to do that. OK. No, it's kind of crazy, right? So I experience the same thing when my neighbors say, what do you do, John? Why well, do research? What does that mean? I say, well, we try to understand the forces of nature and how they impact human health. Really? <laughs> you do that? OK. In other words, what, what good is that? OK. And, and so this is the kind of question that you're going to be asked for your whole career as biomedical scientists. And this is really hard, by the way. It's a huge learning curve. Anyone relate to that? Huge learning curve, takes many years. Often you're not paid for it when you're learning. Anything of this ringing a bell? OK. At the end of this, we derive inspiration. I want you to raise your hands if you've heard a lecture that you thought changed your life at a biomedical seminar. OK. And I think a lot of us are here for that reason. It was a teacher, a, a professor, a lecturer, and we just said, that's what I want to be involved in, OK? And this is, this is pure and simple inspiration. So remember that metaphor. We'll get back to it. So we're scientists. We look at data. I'm going to show a few slides, not to depress you, but as a part of a reality check. So this is the US, and, and I think we're going to have some maybe more recent examples of, of, of this kind of data later. Um, this is graduates awarded by field. And we're, we've stopped here in 2008 because we have more data here. And what I want you to notice is they, that there was a steady increase in awards uh, granted to MDs till about 1985 or 86. And it's been rather stable since then. 
uh, you'll notice the same trend for uh, chemistry PhDs. Uh, and then you'll see an increase in two categories, clinical sciences PhDs and basic biomedical science PhD. People doing bi biomedical research, okay? <clears throat> so there's a stable production of chemistry since about 1980, stable production of clinical sciences and behavioral sciences, but the increasing production of biomedical PhDs that coincide with an H doubling. And by the way, if any of this interests you, we have a wonderful website on the NIH website with much of this information, okay? So you can find all of what I'm gonna talk about uh, on our, our own website. Now, uh, when you look for causation, uh, you, you can also look at U.S. trained biomedical PhDs in postdoctoral research, research positions by years since their degree. So if you look at this, this is the so-called NIH doubling, and we're going to talk a lot about that today. It was actually the best of times and worst of times for biomedical research in this, in this institution. And what you'll notice here is that over 60% of biomedical PhDs started their careers during the 1990s. Over 60% of biomedical PhDs started their careers in the 1990s, started their postdocs, okay? Okay? The percentage taking postdocs fell during this doubling period. So this was really the, the first time, in, in, and I've looked at this uh, historically, where, this, where the number of people taking postdoctoral positions actually fell. And, and we, we can talk about the many reasons uh, where that may have, why that may have happened. Okay. Now, I know most of you guys feel like you're overpaid, right? Okay. <laughs> well, this, this I find to be an interesting, uh, very interesting graph. Zero to nine years after a PhD, okay, we can identify people in the biological sciences by virtue of their relatively low salary. Okay? But there's good news. After 10 to 25 years after the PhD, they in fact catch up. In fact, in uh, it, some of this data suggests they may even surpass their colleagues in some of the uh, social sciences and in chemistry. So uh, th this, this may be worth talking about in the discussion period, and I'm sure our panelists have some ideas about why that trend started and how it's propagated. So think of these as fuel for questions and thought, okay? Um, now, this one is one that I'm going to talk a little bit about because uh, this, this is a little bit misleading. You might say, well, uh, the, at the age of first PhD, which is here, first non-postdoctoral job and first tenure-track job, it looks like that's been steady for years. Actually, at about the time this graph ends, uh, what happened was very unfortunate, and that is uh, the, the, the number of people getting their tenure, first tenure-track job drop, actually dropped. And so this is not fully characteristic, but you'll notice that over the period that we're going to be discussing today, from 1980 to 2004, this is a rather steady, rather steady uh, rate. That is, um, that the, the, basically people are around 38 years old when they get their first job. Okay, I was a little bit older than that. I'll admit. Okay, some of us were a little younger, but on average. Okay, now I have to show you something that that many of you have seen. Uh, Sally Rocky present, I think. Um, and it's been affectionately referred to as the graying of the biomedical demographic. Okay, now about the time when, um, about the time when some of us were getting our medical or PhDs, uh, this was the distribution, about 1980. Uh, and I think this is a slightly younger crowd than I'm used to talking to, but anyway, uh, certainly some of us were in graduate school and then in the 1970s, and were awarded our PhD about this time. You'll notice that about 40 was the average uh, and roughly the modal distribution for NIH R01 PIs. The medical school faculty uh, mirrored that, okay? So that was 1980. I'm going to play this kind of quickly, and I'm going to move time to near the present. And this is what happened. Okay? Now, I'm not a statistician, but I can tell you that over the course of time, that distribution changed, okay? <laughs> now, I can't tell you that the same people who were 35 here 
became these, age, uh, these ancient mariners here, okay? Although some did, I being one of them. Um, so this, this, uh, this kind of graph can be viewed as a scary example of the aging demographic, okay? Now, when I look at this graph, and I'm sitting in the seats where you're sitting, I think, aha, what a wonderful opportunity I have, because it turns out these folks can't live forever, <laughs> okay? They can't work forever. They probably can't even think forever. Um, and so I think there's a wonderful window of opportunity that maybe our other panelists will discuss in greater detail for young scientists who are willing to be science surfers, to prepare, and, and we talked about preparedness, and to be patient to wait for windows of opportunity, okay? Now, let's, let's talk for a few minutes about reality check, and these are real numbers. Now, I'm, this is not from the NIH website. This is actually from an independent organization, the American Society for Cell Biology. Um, I think they did a wonderful job of showing um, the various paths that one can take with this degree. And basically, they're asking the question, where will a biology PhD take you? And they don't mean this tongue in cheek. They, they really wanted to trace the path of young PhDs. So let's, uh, let's start over here. So <clears throat> turns out about every year, 16,000 students start biology PhD programs. OK, that's, that's a lot of kids. Um, turns out that 37% dropped out. That's a lot. But then again, they flunk courses. They don't like their professors. They learn, they want to do other things. I mean, life happens, 37%. OK, um, 9,000 receive PhD. OK, that's a, that's a pretty big pool entering this job market. 70% um, of those, it is thought, uh, at least in this population, do a postdoc. 30% don't do a postdoc. We'll talk about them in a few minutes. Let's talk about those that do a postdoc. So this creates a pool of current postdocs that range between 37 to 68,000, depending on who you classify as a postdoc, OK? And uh, it's kind of one of those things when you ask people to self-identify as a postdoc, oh, I'm not postdoc. <laughs> OK, so there's a bit of that. If you're a research associate, OK, whether you have independence or not, you, you may not identify yourself as a postdoc. So that's why that number is a bit. I actually asked the ASCB why that number was so variable. 15% of this pool get tenure-track faculty jobs within six years of entering this cycle, OK? <clears throat> so there are roughly 29,000 current tenured and tenure-track faculty. Uh, there's about 17,000 current uh, PhDs doing non-science jobs. I like this little thing here. It's, it's, I think it says a lot. Um, there are 22,500 industry researchers. OK? <clears throat> so now let's, let's follow this path. You don't do a postdoc, right? So uh, about 10% of these former postdocs consider themselves unemployed. So this is up from 2%. Once again, unemployment is not something one readily volunteers. And so these numbers are a bit uh, ephemeral, OK? Um, the other, the other part of this is that current non-tenure track academic positions uh, amount to a fairly large percentage of the total. So these are folks who are in research associate positions, who are living on grants at largely extramural, uh, in extramural communities, doing wonderful work, waiting for the chance, perhaps, to, uh, or, or in fact living most of their career on, on R01 and for direct uh, funding from the government. And then there are these current non-research science-related jobs. And this has really been the largest uh, growth. Uh, there's been a lot of, of science, non-research science jobs that have arisen since the 1980s. And so these are the, the numbers. So uh, what, what they're suggesting here is that you can view a faculty job as a kind of alternative career. So and this is a statistic that bothers some of us. Uh, at, at this rate, less than 8% of entering PhD students will become tenure-track faculty. Yet 53% rank research professorships as their most desired career. So that's a perception reality problem. And, and we'll discuss that. 
okay. Um, and, and I think we'll discuss it probably in, in greater detail uh, when we hear all, all the speakers' perspective. So I'm gonna make some real simple suggestions and then we're gonna do like a two-minute role play, okay? I'm gonna suggest that you prepare for the career you envision yourself having. Prepare for it. Have a plan B. Probably you want a plan C also, okay? So uh, an, an example, what does that mean? Plan, that, that sounds kind of silly. Well, when you're applying for jobs, you may try for some of the so-called first-tier academic positions. You might also apply for some secondary positions. You might even apply for a research associate job because the time window when you're a postdoc is very limited and you want to, to, to give yourself as, as many options uh, as possible. So that's what this means. When I say choose a good advisor, I mean this in the, in the strict sense of the word. Find out before you choose that advisor what their attitudes are about your future. Will they help you in that regard? Uh, is it important to them? What is their view of this problem? Um, PIs range from people who will say there is no problem. If you do good science, you'll get a job. How many have heard that? Okay, some have. To others saying it's one of the most fundamental problems that I see in biomedical science. I'm one of those. I, that's why I'm here today, okay? So you have the entire range. Give yourself a chance to experience the joy, okay? A lot of people look at those statistics and they say, no way I'm going through that. But they don't even know what they're missing because they've never experienced the joy of making a discovery, seeing something no one else has seen, and it is absolutely transforming. Give yourself the chance to feel that. You may say, eh, it wasn't so great, I'll be a lawyer. Okay, you may not. Okay, <clears throat> don't delude yourself. Don't say, well, I know the statistics say one thing, but you know, I'm really good, I've always been good in school, I'll be fine. Okay, we don't want that. We don't want that. Even PI shouldn't do that. Particularly PI shouldn't do that, <laughs> right? They, they have to be constantly growing. Have an open mind about the path to take. And that's where this analogy really works. You know, it may be that you're not interested in taking that big wave. You see some nice backwash over here. I'm, going, I'm fine here. I can enjoy myself in, in, that, in that scenario. I can't enjoy this. I can't be in this competitive environment and maintain my health, my sanity, and my family. Legitimate, perfectly legitimate. Uh, keep a broad list of contacts and network. Okay. Does anyone want to hear about networking? Just for a minute. What is that? Okay. So um, is anyone willing to volunteer to be a chairman? Come on, guy. If not, I'll ask John to do it. <laughs> oh, I know. He's, okay. Um, I'll be both, I guess. So has anyone seen uh, the, the recent commercials um, where there's, uh, there's uh, and I won't mention his name because it's probably, there's an actor who has a sordid past who, who says, don't be the bad me, be the good me. So I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna uh, try to portray three examples of what you should and should not do when your department chairman asks you a question, okay? Um, you guys don't want to try to do this? Uh, uh, okay, so let me ask John. I just heard your seminar. It was quite a job, quite a good job. Um, what's, all, what's going on? Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming. Okay. Response one, thanks for coming. Response two, I'm very excited to see you here because I have so many questions about how to proceed with this career. You know, and you've shown an interest. I hope at some point I can come make an appointment to talk to you about your experience. Okay. The third me would be, I am so excited about pursuing this. I have to find a way to get this funded. Okay. Can you help me? And the fourth me, I just don't know. Sometimes all I want to do is just bury myself and quit thinking about this. But you know, I have so many problems. Is there any chance I can make an appointment to just talk about these problems? Okay. Now, I'm gonna ask you, which of these Johns would you invite to your office? Okay, the brooding John who wants to complain about everything, 
I mean, they might be a lot of fun, but we have a human aversion to avoiding that kind of thing, okay? I mean, that's uh, not a great I idea, I think, generally, okay? Um, we also feel a little uncomfortable about saying, okay, well, thank, uh, I'm, I'm so interested in your seminar, whether you ask me or not, I'd like to talk to you about your future. You're not gonna find too many proactive PIs. If you don't show a little interest in their input, they won't get it, okay? So what I'm gonna suggest, and this is, um, this is just a suggestion, is just like our surfer friend, when an opportunity emerges, take full advantage of it. Show that person of authority you're excited about the work you do, show them why, and try to tap into that vast experience they have uh, to, to learn something. And believe me, scientists love talking about their past. Even things that didn't happen, they'll tell you about, okay? So, 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 they, so we love to talk about how we got where we are, uh, even if, if it uh, is a bit of a revisionist story. So, so it is something that people love to do, but make sure you're available when they make that request. And have an elevator talk ready. And I think you guys have all heard about elevator talk. Be able to talk about your work in the amount of time it takes for you and the department chair to ride two or three floors. Because that's all the exposure you're going to have to some of your, some of your department heads. Okay? So I'm going to stop now and turn this over to Dr. Gallup with his perspective from a more clinical perspective. And we're going to, at the end, we're going to have a chance to have a more open discussion about some of these topics. Okay? Okay, good afternoon. John's pretty funny. As, as he said earlier, you got three Johns and no bathroom. <laughs> so, so this is the place I work in, just up the, uh, the road here. And I, I show you this flagpole because you may not realize that, that you know, the grounds that you're working on here is, is a wildlife preserve. There's a red-tailed uh, hawk that lives right around here. And, not infrequently perches on top of this flagpole. Not a bald eagle, but it's, it's pretty good. Uh, it's a fun place, I think, and I've spent most of my career in this uh, complex. And what I want to do today is to tell you a little bit about um, some thoughts about uh, uh, the relationships between PhDs and MDs and physicians and scientists and how you can really, I think, have a tremendous amount of fun. So this is a slide Francis Collins showed last week at a meeting of uh, translational scientists here in Washington, and I, I thought it was kind of neat, so I wanted to show it to you. Uh, I'm the guy over here in the, on, the, on the left, and I, maybe this is you. This is John, John Hoffman. <laughs> and uh, it reads, by training, philosophy, motivation, and research styles, Doctors and scientists might as well be in different, from different phyla. And this was from Natalie Angier, in the, published in the New York Times in 1990. I don't agree with that. <laughs> and what I hope that you will <clears throat> go away with after uh, this demystifying medicine course is this feeling that if you can speak the same languages, you can really have a lot of fun. Just to give you an example, my lab over the years has shrunk. I now have four people in my lab, including myself. I'm an MD, and I have three PhDs who work with me. And if you say, people say to me, why, why, why do you have so many PhDs? And I'll say, because I, I need them to make sure I, we do good stuff. And, uh, uh, and, that, and that's why. And that's what I believe. So this is an exciting time. Uh, John may have presented uh, what might be perceived as um, uh, uh, concerns, and uh, I'll get to a few different ones in a moment. But <clears throat> it's really an exciting time if you want to do clinical investigation. There are new technologies, new knowledge related to basic and translational and clinical medicine. You, you've heard our, our president talk about, and if you heard the State of the Union address about uh, this thing that he's called precision medicine. Um, now, I always thought when I was a kid and I went to my 
doctor that he gave me precision medicine. He, you know, he, he gave me penicillin when I had a sore throat. I thought that was pretty precise. If you ever had a blood transfusion, that's pretty precision medicine, right? They take your blood, they type it, um, and, and it goes on and on from there. But this is new. This we're talking about applying the latest in uh, molecular and genetic uh, technologies to tailor treatments that used to be generic. So take, for example, chemotherapy, which was invented in this building in the clinical center. You, you may not realize that. That was one of the great accomplishments here in the 1960s. Uh, use of a drug called methotrexate for women who had metastatic choriocarcinoma, which is a solid tumor, untreatable. Uh, this guy, Ching Lai, decided just to give it. There was no IRB, no institutional review board, and, and he gave it, and the woman got better. And he gave it to another woman, and she got better. And then his boss yelled at him because they didn't solicit any kind of review, and, and he how to leave. He went to Mount Sinai and did other great things. Um, so uh, NIH's efforts to ensure full participation of physician and scientists is real. Now, there's a lot of things going on. You've probably seen what I'm going to show you before, uh, but the uh, Human Genome Project is obviously one example of uh, a technique that's going to help precision medicine. This is the cost of doing a whole genome sequence. It's, it's now... Uh, uh, actually, this year, it's probably gotten below, um, whoops, um, $1,000. So it's cheaper than an MRI exam. It's something that uh, you, you can imagine. You're going to get your whole genome sequenced. Everybody's going to. That's going to happen. And then the question is, what do you do with all that information? Uh, and, uh, and here's some of the things that are going to happen. So. You, we're going to get an understanding of more and more diseases. So the number of diseases that we now have a molecular uh, basis for based on uh, uh, the genome uh, 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 characterization of that disease has grown, grown tremendously. Look, a two-log increase from around 1994 to the present. But here's the problem. There's only about 500 diseases for which there's a specific treatment. So here's the challenge for all of you. How do we close this gap? Uh, that's what we want to do. And, uh, and I hope you do it soon before I get much older, because I don't have that much time left. <laughs> so there's other things going on at the clinical center up the road, including uh, several years ago, a guy named Bill Gall started a program that he called the Undiagnosed Diseases Program. And, and what he did is he said, I'm going to admit patients from all over the country that have stumped the stars. So I'm going to, if you're a Mass General Hospital or a Johns Hopkins or a San Francisco a, a General or wherever, and you have a patient who you can't figure out, send them to us. We'll, we'll see what we can do. And, uh, and it happened. So all of a sudden, thousands of patients started uh, asking to be seen. And, uh, and just in the last few years, 3,000 medical records were looked at. Uh, he accepted 700 cases as patients he thought that maybe we could do something for, and about a quarter of them, a diagnosis was made, and four new diseases were discovered, and this is just in a few years. Uh, so, uh, you know, we think that's pretty spectacular. So spectacular that uh, this program, which started here at NIH, is now metastasizing. It's... Uh, there's a undiagnosed diseases network that's now been established that's uh, all over the country. So different places now have these programs. And if you participate in these programs, as a doctor, you're phenomenally excited because every patient is evaluated by a team of doctors rep representing every uh, subspecialty of medicine. So you have a neurologist, you have an internist, you have a rheumatologist, you have a uh, neurosurgeons, you have pathologists, they all get together in the same room to talk about each patient, and, and it makes a difference. And then you go back into your labs and talk to the uh, PhDs who often come to these meetings themselves, and you say, you know, what can we do? So the vision for precision medicine is to build a broad research program to encourage a creative approaches to precision medicine, test them rigorously, and ultimately use them to build 
the evidence base needed to guide clinical practice. And in the near term, this is going to be applied primarily to cancer, uh, where there's this tremendous opportunity to understand how mutations, mutations that are either occurring in the germline or uh, and somatic mutations uh, can lead to cancer and design treatments to attack that. And longer term, it generate the knowledge base necessary to move precision medicine to virtually all areas of health and disease. And so what's happening, uh, what the president's vision is, there'll be a million people in the country who will become a cohort who will have their genome sequenced and then be followed for years to try to understand what mutations uh, or what uh, abnormalities in the genome lead to what diseases. So when I think of you, and as I was thinking of this talk, you know, here's the challenge, the biggest challenge that I could come up with that I think uh, you, you have to think about. And, and hopefully this is going to change. You've all heard about uh, the budget for the NIH, which is the major funder of biomedical research in our country and in the world, uh, uh, has been uh, held flat, so that means the buying power has probably dropped 25 to 30 percent over the last seven years. But people say that this year there's some opportunity for optimism. The, the politicians, uh, everybody likes the NIH, whether you're Republican or Democrat, and they want to give us money. But there are other sources of funding that you have to think about. Uh, uh, industry, philanthropy, uh, really creative people who are very rich who would like to uh, give you money, and, and don't hesitate to look for that. So here are some personal thoughts that I just had that I, I somehow felt last night that I, I should share with you. Uh, you've probably heard similar things in, uh, from others, but my first one is in tough times, like tough budget, I think the glass is half full. So if you see an aging population of scientists, don't say, I have no chance of... Uh, getting a job because there are all these old guys hanging around who are going to take all the grant money. No, I think that they're all going to die uh, in the near future, and then there'll be great opportunities for you. So this is a time of unusual opportunity scientifically. Uh, team science can be lots of fun. I really believe that. Uh, for me, there's nothing more exciting than to talk about a, a problem in a, in a patient group that uh, we've been studying with some uh, chemists and, and have them help design a potential new drug. So from my own experience, I study phagocytes, and I'm interested in inflammation. And one of the patient groups I've devoted my life to is a group of patients with a disease called chronic granulomatous disease of childhood, or CGD. These are uh, children whose neutrophils and macrophages can't produce um, hydrogen peroxide or hypochlorous acid, which is bleach or chlorine. Uh, because they have a defect of their enzyme, NADPH oxidase, and um, they can't cause the univalent production of oxygen to end up with those products. They get infections, and they get granulomas. Well, we've been studying them, and we've helped to define the genetic mutations in them. We've come up with some treatments. But just this year, we found that these same patients don't get atherosclerosis of their carotid arteries. Now, that really intrigued me. And I said, you know, how, how can that be? And, and, and so for the first time, it suggests, at least to me, that these reactive oxygen products, which they can't produce, this loss of function of this enzyme NADPH, which makes them really sick, spares them from a critical event. And isn't it possible that maybe the NADPH oxidase should be a target for a new drug? So I've been working with uh, some chemists at NCATS and uh, some of the folks in, in my own program, and, and we've been trying to design some molecules that might inhibit this enzyme. We have some candidates, and you know, our dream is this year maybe to get into some animals, models for atherosclerosis, and see if we can inhibit it. So it can be a lot of fun, and it's clearly team science. So my fourth message to you is ask an important question. In my experience, it's just as hard to ask, answer an unimportant question as it is an important question. So if you're going to ride under that wave, at least pick a, you know, an important project 
uh, or one you believe is really important. And, and before you start working, you ought to ask yourself, why is this important? If you can't answer that, you, you might think before you start spending, you know, two or three years studying something. Uh, find your own niche. It's very nice if you can start a new field, uh, you know, and uh, uh, that's something to think about. Trust your own instincts. I really believe that. Once you think you have an important project, if everybody else says to you it's a stupid project, don't study it, that doesn't mean it's a stupid project. When I started off, uh, I was the only person in Building 10 interested in inflammation and interested in neutrophils and macrophages. And everybody said, those are stupid cells. You should be working on B cells and T cells. Those are the smart cells. Why are you wasting your time? And I said, well, you know, I, I kind of like it. And, and now there's a, uh, an initiative that's warmed my heart that the intramural program is putting out as uh, a major area of emphasis for the NIH to you know, figure out how to regulate inflammation. Um, you heard about this one. Have fun. If you're not having fun, do something else. It, you know, it, this business is serious business. It's very time consuming and uh, takes a lot of energy. You, you should really enjoy it. And then, of course, I have to say, if you're working around here, take advantage of this phenomenal resource, the clinical center. So let me just tell you a few things about this place, uh, which uh, you've seen up the road. So this is the largest hospital in the world, totally dedicated to clinical research. Um, it's a place where you can really link genotype to phenotype. Uh, not many places, or probably no place in the world, can do phenotype the way we can do it, studying you know, what's wrong with someone and describe it at great depth. And we can do cell therapy. Uh, so for those who don't know anything about this place, uh, it's seen about a half a million patients since it opened in 1953. I can tell you its opening was delayed a year by the Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare because she was worried that it was too expensive. And every year since then, everybody worries that it's too expensive. But I think it's one of the great gifts that Congress has given the American people. So today, there are 240 beds in this hospital, and the budget's about $400, $409 million. It's, uh, it's the biggest building on this campus. It occupies about 25% of the space, uh, nearly 4 million square feet of space. So it's a hospital surrounded by research labs. Our nurses say there's no other hospital like it. And so what's different? Well, first of all, every patient is on a research protocol. Care is free. A few years ago, Congress worked very hard to make us bill patients. Uh, I was thrilled last summer when we convinced them that we didn't want to do that. And they said, OK. Uh, provide travel and housing for the patients. There's about 2,800 people who work as hospital employees and another 4,000 who work in the hospital who work for the institute. So over 6,000 people work in that building. And of those, about 1,200 are credentialed physicians. So the ratio of doctors to beds is enormous. But of those 1,200, maybe 400, I'd let take care of any of you. Uh, the others have sort of <laughs> forgotten. <laughs> uh, and the engine that drives the place are the clinical protocols, and there are about 1,600 of them. And uh, the about half, a little less than half, are what we call clinical trials. And those are mostly uh, what we call phase one and two. So they're first in human studies with the new drug. Uh, natural history studies are almost another half, and that's mostly patients with rare diseases. We see more patients with rare diseases than anywhere else uh, because, uh, one, we can help those people. Two, it gives them hope. But most importantly, it's a window into common diseases, like I just mentioned to you in atherosclerosis. And, and we all believe that quite passionately. So the major emphasis of this place is to study the pathophysiology of disease, to conduct first in human with new drugs, and to study patients with rare diseases, uh, which aren't so rare. It's estimated 25 million Americans have a rare disease. And every time you figure out the genetic basis of a common disease, you have a new rare disease. So, uh, so how many breast cancers are there? How many mutations? So what do we have in this place? We have some remarkable things. This is a, uh, uh, an image from a, a, uh, our biomechanics lab. We can take a, you and put you in this thing and, and produce your skeleton and watch you walking around, looking at your muscle groups. 
it's, it's pretty cool. And this was used first to develop devices for children who have brittle bone disease or osteogenesis imperfecta in children with cerebral palsy and getting them up and walking. And more recently, it's been used to make artificial limbs for our wounded warriors coming back from Iraq and um, Afghanistan. We have metabolic chambers. You put a patient in one of these rooms, which has magic here in the ceiling. It, it, it takes the air, determines how much CO2 and um, oxygen is in the being expelled by the patient, and you can measure carbohydrate and fat metabolism second by second while patients are doing something. This was originally put in place to study obesity, but it's also a phenomenal way to characterize wasting syndromes. Our transfusion medicine department can make stem cells. Uh, they're making iPS cells. They're making um, uh, stem cells uh, for example, from the pancreatic islet cells to look to see if you can uh, help patients with diabetes. Uh, pretty much any kind of stem cell you can think of, we're really good at that. And clinical grade stem cells so that if you, if you make an observation that you think can get translated into people, this is the place, probably the best place in the world to be doing that in our opinion. Imaging is phenomenally strong. Attached to this hospital is an MRI facility that builds tomorrow's MRIs in partnership with industry. Siemens, Philips, uh, they recently finished a seven Tesla MRI machine, which allows very good look at fibers crossing throughout the brain. They're now building a 15 Tesla machine, which they tell me you'll see uh, organelles in a living person. So if that really happens, it will be phenomenal. Uh, this happens to be an operating room of the future. Uh, which I could spend a lot of time telling you about, but I won't. We have a phenomenal PET program with three cyclotrons to make tomorrow's uh, ligands for looking at receptor ligand interactions in all sorts of different disease states. Our pharmacy has a GMP facility for formulating and making new drugs. So if industry isn't interested in a drug and you have something you want to make, we can make it. We can do analytic and quality control. We can do the pharmacokinetics of the study. I see Juan Latour is in the background. He's one of the uh, uh, people who helps to um, make sure that's all done right. Uh, and this is a sense of how much we can do in a day, an eight-hour day. A lot of capsules, tablets, volumes, load syringes, make candidate vaccines and biologics. You operate it around the clock. You can multiply times three. And this is a great resource. And I'm showing you all this because you're going to see in a minute Wherever you are, whether you stay here or go somewhere else, you have access to all this, and, and we don't want you to forget that. Um, we have this phenomenally special isolation unit, probably the best in the world, uh, where we've admitted our patients with Ebola. Most recently, a patient was discharged a few weeks ago, um, and, and it's completely self-contained. We, we have auto, three autoclaves for uh, making sure that all the waste is properly processed. You'd be interested to know everything that leaves that unit is, except for the people, are autoclaves. And <laughs> so it's sterile. And then it gets incinerated. So it's, you know, completely sterile. Then you want to put it in a dump. None of the dumps would accept it. In Bellevue, where you heard there was a patient, uh, they couldn't put it in the New Jersey. They had it uh, freighted over to Texas to uh, uh, bury the waste, because Texas was the only place that would take it. We put it at Fort Detrick, because they owe us some favors, so uh, <laughs> we, we had a place. Data management, uh, when, uh, uh, you're going to hear in a second, one of the things we were asked to do is open the doors of this place to the extramural community. And so Francis Collins said to me, so if you, if you do that, how are people at the universities going to share data with us on all the things we collect data on? So we've been working on that. Uh, uh, our electronic medical record uh, is put into this database we have every night. Uh, six of the institutes have their own different systems, which we put into the same uh, data warehouse, and they're all now speaking to each other. Um, we, uh, we Basically, you can do hypothesis testing and data mining from all this information 
uh, and that's the goal. And we're hoping this will be a template for perhaps uh, data sharing in a, in a much wider scale. Uh, but uh, it seems to be working. Training is something we put a lot of emphasis on. We've trained a lot of people over the years. Uh, when I started, Harold Varmus appointed me, and he says, you'll take care of the research. You'll take care of uh, the patients. Worry about training. So I took him to heart because he was my boss, but he, he was right, and we built a curriculum that has three courses, uh, uh, an introductory course into clinical research, a course in clinical pharmacology that Juan teaches, uh, and an ethics and regulatory aspects of human subjects research that Christine Grady teaches. You can see a lot of people have taken these courses. Um, it's actually over 35,000 people, and that's because we also do long distance learning, and uh, we're now in 26 countries around the world, people participating uh, in live. It's pretty exciting. And actually, next week, we're, we're going to South Africa to give a week intense course there. <clears throat> we were reviewed a few years ago by Joe Goldstein and Ed Benz, and they said, you know, one of your problems is you don't teach people how to run a clinical research facility. There are a lot of people who would like to learn that. So we, we created a sabbatical program in clinical research management in partnership with the sec Office of the Secretary, uh, the FDA, and us, and to demystify the bureaucracy. To, uh, so if you have any interest in running a clinical research facility or learning how it's done, you can do this. There are 26 electives. You can pick whatever you want, stay for, do it for a week or do it for a year, and uh, we think it's a, it's a pretty neat opportunity. Uh, there's a guy named Don Ganim who was on our, my board, and one day when we were talking about opening the clinical center, he said, you got to give something back to the extramural community, particularly to the PhDs. So why don't you start a camp, a summer camp for PhD students? So we did, and that was launched in 2012, a two-week intensive course each summer at the clinical center. Uh, the students come from all over the country, and they get lectures and didactic talks. Uh, if you're interested in this, the next one's given July 6th to the 17th, uh, and you might want to look into seeing whether that's something for you. We were, I told you we were reviewed by a congressional committee, and they said we could stay open, but that we should change our vision and serve as a state-of-the-art national resource. And in response, NIH created a new grant, which you should put in the back of your hats as something you might want entitled Opportunities for Collaborative Research at the Clinical Center. And these support any partnership by someone outside who wants to partner with something at the uh, NIH Clinical Center. They're a half a million dollars a year. Uh, we just increased the duration to four years. Uh, they can be renewed. These are direct costs. Um, there must be a PI from outside and a co-PI from intramural. Uh, international people can participate. Something has to be done at the clinical center. You don't need to see patients. You can use our, our PET facility. You can use the pharmaceutical development service. And there'll be a new FOA issued in June. And these programs are pretty much uh, all over the country. Uh, these are the first two cycles shown by the dark and the light blue colors, um, even in Hawaii. And I was pleased to know that people in remote locations felt they could do something here. So you don't have to be here to use this resource. Now, I'm going to stop here because I think I've spoken long enough. Um, there are other funding opportunities. We have a bench to bedside program that was established to bring together a basic and a clinical investigator. Oh, maybe I'll show you that. Uh, they're seed projects. They're $135,000 a year for two years. Uh, and they can be within the intramural program, or they can be between intramural and extramural. And actually, there's a lot of partnerships with extramural today. And they are funded by a bunch of offices at NIH uh, that are listed here. Uh, I have to go around with a tin cup every year to, to raise the money. I don't have any money for this. Uh, but we coordinate it. And you can see that these things are all around the country and, uh, and internationally, too. This is my last slide, and I just hope that you get a feeling that this place that we call the clinical center 
is something you really, you should know about. You should think, maybe, you should dream a little bit if, if you wanna you know, do something that is, is translatable to patients. This is available to you. If you uh, look in the websites, you can find partners. If you can't, call me up and I'll try to find someone who might be interested in what you wanna do. And uh, similarly, I hope the people who are the docs who work at the clinical center know that they can call upon you for help when they say, gee, I think I have a target that maybe would be a neat drug. Can you help me figure out how to make a drug? That's what you guys can do. So thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'll, I'll follow up by talking more about the basic science side of things um, and more from an extramural point of view than from an intramural point of view. And talk about some of the work that we've been doing at NIGMS to think about how we can deal with some of the problems that <clears throat> John alluded to at the beginning of uh, the talk. Let me just tell you briefly about NIGMS's mission since uh, we are almost entirely an externally facing institute. 99% uh, of our budget, or more than that, actually goes to extramural research. And we only have one very small intramural program, that's the Pratt uh, Postdoctoral Fellows Program. So we really have two overarching missions that are related to each other. The first is to promote fundamental research on living systems in order to lay the foundations for advances in disease diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. And then the second, which is related to that, is to enable the development of the best trained, most innovative and productive biomedical research workforce possible. And I'll just highlight that phrase, lay the foundation, because that's really what NIGMS is about. We lay the foundation through the research we support, most of which is basic science, and the training we promote for the other institutes, which have missions focused on specific organ systems or specific diseases. So in many ways, we're the basic science and training institute of NIH. Um, I like to point out whenever I talk that we have a budget of about uh, $2.4 billion, um, and that is not monopoly money, okay? Uh, this is hard-earned taxpayer money, and so really what our job is is to ensure that it's being invested in that fundamental biomedical research that I told you about in the most efficient and effective way possible. So my job really is to optimize the returns on the taxpayers' investments in terms of the amount and the quality of the science that comes out of it. And that, that's a, a job we take very, very seriously. So <clears throat> people often ask me what I do all day long, and I go to a lot of meetings, as does John. Um, but the really great part of my job is I get to think about really hard questions. Okay, so that's really what my job is about, thinking about hard questions. And these are some of the hard questions I think about on a daily basis, and I won't go through every one, but there are things like, um, early career investigators, how do we better support um, the kinds of things John was talking about, people establishing their careers in research, um, the efficiency of the system, the academic business model and how it is um, creating efficiencies or inefficiencies, the reward system, a variety of things involving um, the training, postdocs we heard about, you know, that is a holding tank at some level, a peer review, et cetera. But as I thought about these issues over the course of the last almost two years, what I realized is that at the heart of all those hard problems, there is one hard problem that is connected to and in many ways driving all of these other hard problems. <clears throat> and I reasoned that if we couldn't fix this central problem, we weren't gonna have uh, much of an ability to deal with these other problems. And that problem is how we fund science, okay? So, probably most of you are aware that the way we fund science predominantly is through a project-based model. Okay, the R01 you've heard of, um, that's the major research grant we give. That is a project-based grant. So we're asking investig investigators to take the research going on in their labs and break it up into units, which they call projects, right? And then predict four or five years in advance exactly what they're going to be working on in that project, okay? 
Now, this model um, creates, at least in my view, and the view of a no number of other people, a number of inefficiencies in the system. Now, I'm not going to enumerate them all, but let me give you two examples of these inefficiencies so you can get a sense of what I'm thinking about. So the first problem with this model, this project-based model, is it doesn't reflect how science is actually done, at least not done in the best cases, right? Okay. So again, we're asking people to predict in advance, four or five years, exactly what I'm going to be doing. And I would submit to you that if you know exactly what you're going to be doing in a scientific research endeavor, four or five years in advance, it's probably not worth doing. Okay. Um, so that's one problem. We're asking people to take their research, which in its best you know, way would be done by following your nose and as you come up with new ideas or see new things, go in that direction and instead really confine it, right, by predicting in advance what you're going to do. So we're really asking people in some ways to take a square peg and put it into a round hole. Um, and that, I would suggest may have a constraining effect on the kind of science that is being done. So that's one inefficiency. The other is related to this, or another is related to this, this distribution of funding that I mentioned um, here. Because we have a system in which investigators can break their research programs going on in their labs into as many different units as they're creative enough to do, that is projects, and then submit as many of these projects for funding as they can write, and get as many of them as they convince the, can convince the study section to give them, we've created um, a system in which there could be significant um, ill distribution of funding, right? Where some people have much more than is productive and others are really struggling to survive. And I can show you that here. <clears throat> so this is an analysis we did of NIGMS investigators. So the definition is if you have an NIGMS grant, you're an NIGMS investigator. And then we counted how much NIH direct costs each of these investigators have. And then we put it into bins. So each of these bins is the top of a range. So these people have up to 185,000 NIH direct costs. These have up to uh, 210, et cetera. Uh, this red line, which is this axis here, shows the average number of NIH grants that the people in those bins have. Okay, So it goes from one on this to four and a half over here. Now, if you analyze this in a slightly different way, what you discover is that 5% of our grantees have a quarter of the NIH funds that our grantees have, and 20% of them have a half, okay? Now, that may be just something weird about NIGMS, but it turns out if you look across NIH as a whole, these exact same numbers hold. So 5% have a quarter, 20% have a half. There was an article on the front page of the New York Times about a year ago about the ill distribution of Medicare uh, reimbursement to physicians and how a big problem this was, it was exactly the same distribution. 5% are getting a quarter and 20% are getting a half. So if it's a problem there, uh, you might think it's a problem here. But maybe you don't. Um, and I should point out, some, some may say, well, even if you could fix this problem, is it going to put much money back into the system to support other investigators? And the answer is, well, there's a lot of money here. If you just look at NIGMS funded investigators who have over half a million dollars in direct cost, that pool just of NIGMS investigators is $400 million in NIGMS funds. Okay, so even if I could only recover 10% of this money, that's $40 million that I could put back in the system. So we're not talking about chump change here. This is a significant amount of funds. Now you might say, well, the reason these people have a lot of money is because they're the best, they're the most productive, and they should have that much money. So that's just the way the system works. But a variety of analyses have been done over the past five years that indicate that that's not really true. Okay, so here's one that with Jeremy Berg, my predecessor, uh, and Paul Sheehy and Matt Eblen did, looking at productivity and impact of NIGMS-funded uh, investigators, the same group I just told you about, as a function of their total NIH direct costs. Okay. And what they saw was you know, really kind of surprising was that if, if one goes from zero, no funding at all, to some relatively moderate range, say two hundred fifty to $300,000, you get a rapid rise in productivity. So this is being measured, I should say, the red lines are publications that were produced during the grant period that's being looked at for that PI. 
The blue, which is an imperfect measure of impact, we now have better ones to look at this, but this is just the average impact factor of the journals in which those investigators published. It's imperfect, but it's some kind of a metric of, you know, was this really flashy science or was this mundane in some way? Anyways, it goes up very rapidly at the beginning, and then what you see is that although it rises thereafter for a period, it's a very shallow slope. And if you look at this in a sort of more quantitative fashion, you find that this is really diminishing returns, okay? That you're not getting even marginal returns where one unit of funding gives you a unit of increase in productivity or impact. And really surprisingly, once you get above, say, 700 to 750,000 in direct costs, it actually goes down. This is raw productivity, not normalized yet or anything. So that's kind of surprising. Now, you can do a quick back of the envelope calculation to see how I think about this in my job as an investor of taxpayer funds, right? So I'm frequently faced with the following decision at one of our council rounds. S established investigator comes in, applies for a grant. It's his third grant, he's already got two. Okay, gets a great score, I'll say it's a five percentile. And if we give him that grant, it's gonna take him from 400,000 in direct costs, that's over here, to 600,000, let's say. And if you just follow this curve, it turns out on average, and of course there are outliers above the curve, but there are also outliers below the curve. On average, that's gonna buy the taxpayers one extra paper. Now, the other thing I'm faced with, okay, so that's one possibility. The other uh, situation is that we also have a new investigator. She's coming in for her first R01. She got a good score, let's say it was a 15th percentile. And you do the calculation there, well, it's gonna take her from zero to say 200,000. That's gonna buy the taxpayers five papers on average. Okay, these are averages, they're outliers, everything else. But just simple back of the envelope calculation says that the second scenario is gonna buy the taxpayers four more papers than if I funded this, okay? So fairly simple, um, at least in these terms. Go ahead. Papers is just one metric, that's right. So that may not be the best one. You may say, well, one great paper is worth 100 mediocre papers, okay? So we have looked at this and a variety of other institutes now have started to look at this using lots of other metrics. So you can use impact-based metrics. This is a bad one, I admit, right? that's just what they did. But you can use all kinds of impact citation, webs of citation normalized for the field, you know, to see how, how hot this paper is. You can look at the top 10% cited papers in the field. They all come out with the same basic conclusion. I mean, the shape may be slightly different, but diminishing returns, okay, over a fairly, you know, moderate level of funding. Now, I don't think this should be too surprising. What, to me, it boils down to is bandwidth, right? We all have a limited bandwidth, and if you are, you know, running one or two things that you're really focusing on, you're gonna be paying more attention. You're gonna be mentoring your students better. You're going to be coming up with more ideas. If you're running five, you've subdivided your bandwidth. So, you know, this is a robust feature, both of these analysis and of behavioral economics in general. I mean, it's been shown in all kinds of different formats um, uh, in various ways. Creative intellectual tasks, you get diminishing returns as you go above a certain required threshold of funding or of, of rewards. Okay. Now, another way of putting this question is what should our metric for funding be, right? Right now, it's the number of grants we give. How many grants do we give out to the community? But an alternative, which I've been suggesting would be perhaps better, is to think about how many investigators we support as our metric of funding, okay? And that may sound trivial at first, but if you think about it, it's actually would be a sea change in how we operate. And it would allow us to focus on a different mission um, and I think optimize the returns again on the taxpayer's investment. So if our mission was to support a broad, diverse portfolio of investigators in a range that gets the most out of each of those investigators, um, I submit that that would be a better way of investing our money than just you know, letting chips fall they, where they may and giving a certain number of grants, regardless of who gets them. Okay, so this kind of thinking has led to an experiment that NIGMS is doing. It's an experiment in how we fund science. I'm gonna tell you the details of it in a second. Um, but the overall idea is to fund research programs instead of individual projects. 
and a program would be the work in somebody's lab that is related to the mission of NIGMS, however broad that is. Um, the idea is to give a single grant, I'll tell you the details of that in a second, to support the research in someone's lab, but once they get that grant, that's the research funding from NIGMS that they can get, okay? So if you get it, you're done, you go do your research, come back in five years. What do we think the advantages of the system would be? And among the advantages are, we think it would increase the stability of funding in ways I'll explain to you in a minute. And by increasing the stability of funding for investigators, we think it, it would enhance their willingness to take on ambitious scientific projects and approach problems creatively, okay? A lot of people feel that this constant worry that you're going to lose your grant or all of your funding causes people to be conservative in the research they do and causes the study sections that review these grants to be conservative in the kind of research it supports, okay? So if we could get around that, increase the stability, we could improve those things. We also want to increase the flexibility for investigators to follow important new directions as they arise during the course of their research, right? I mentioned that project-based funding requires people to say in advance, here's exactly what I'm going to do over the next four years or five years. Right? And that's not really how science works. We want to free people up that if they see something new, they can go off in a new direction. The example I like to give about this is RNAi. Right? RNAi was discovered because of a failed control experiment. Right? They tried, they were doing antisense RNA. They tried just for the heck of it because they're good, you know, they did sense strand as a control. Turned out it worked just as well. Now, thank goodness Andy Fire had the flexibility because he was at the Carnegie, Carnegie Institution, right? And he had stable funding and he had the wisdom and courage to follow this up instead of just saying, forget it. And from that, RNAi was discovered this amazing new pathway. I just did some research. It turns out there are uh, over two dozen clinical trials going on right now with siRNA based therapeutics. Okay, so this is a basic science thing that's now in the clinics, or at least. Um, being tested in the clinics. What I wonder is how many great discoveries like RNAi haven't been made because when the graduate student or the postdoc went to the PI and said, look at this weird control I just did, the PI said, well, that's kind of weird, but we got to renew this grant in 18 months, so get back to the specific aims, right? So we'll never know the answer to that question, but I bet it's more than a few. So anyways, we'd like to give people more flexibility to follow their noses. As I said, we'd like to improve the distribution of funding uh, in order to optimize output. Another way to think about why we want to do this, in addition to the data I showed you, is that inherently for basic research, we have no idea where the next big breakthrough is going to come from. If I knew where it was going to come from, I'd be doing it right now, right? So. We're going to optimize the chances and the number of breakthroughs we get by having a broad, diverse, distributed portfolio, just as if you're investing in the stock market. Okay, so that's another thing we want to do. In addition, we'd really like to reduce the time people spend writing grant applications, which would allow them to spend time instead doing research, mentoring their students, teaching. Okay, right now, people are writing 1.4 grants a year on average. Over a five-year period, that's seven grants. Okay, if we could reduce that to one, that's an enormous saving of time. And it's also enormous saving of time for the review system, right? Um, you know, if you want to improve the review process, and everywhere I go, people say, help improve the review process. Well, the problem is the review process is being asked to do something that it can't really do, which is make these very fine distinctions among very good applications. If we reduce the burden they had, and we're asking them only once every five years to review a grant, totally different situation. Okay, so that's where this experiment that we're doing uh, was born, the Maximizing Investigators Research Award, or MIRA. Again, it's a single NIGMS grant per investigator to fund the research program in their lab. We're using this new mechanism, the R35 mechanism, to replace an R01. Because it's going to be a single grant, we're going to make it on average, the median will be bigger. You know, we want to give you enough to do your work so that you don't have to write another one. Um, and it's going to be longer. So right now we give four-year grants, uh, R01s on average. This will be five years. There'll be a range of direct costs. We do recognize that some research is more expensive. There are researchers that occasionally do beat that curve and can use more money efficiently, right? So there's a range 
um, but it's going to be capped at $750,000. That's the most we think NIGMS should be giving an investigator uh, the total. Not many people will get that much. It's not going to be tied to specific aims. There's not even going to be a specific aims page. The review instead is going to be based on what you've done in the past, which has been shown to be the best indicator actually of you know, your productivity in the next cycle, and your overall research ideas. So what are the questions, the big questions? Why are they important? Why is this field important? And what's the general strategy you think you're going to follow? But you're not tied to that. Okay, if you, a year and a half in, see the weird control, you can follow it. And it's just between you and the study section when you come in for renewal, whether or not that was a good idea or not. Okay? In fact, there's going to be no reference to what it was you proposed in the previous grant. Now, one thing we're going to be doing, and I mentioned stability, so an extra year certainly adds some stability, but we want to add more stability. And so one thing we're putting into the system is to change the funding decisions from being necessary, necessarily binary, that is a digital system that we have now, to being analog, which is we could modulate the budget based on the outcome of the review. So right now, if you come in for a review of your grant and the study section says, well, you did good stuff and you know, got good ideas, but it's not the top of my pile, you're done. You're just not getting funded, okay? That's incredibly unstable in the system. And so what we want to do instead is say, well, we're going to have the option to say instead, okay, you weren't operating maybe at the level of $400,000 a year that you had, but instead of just terminating you, we're going to ramp you down to something else. Keep your lab going, maybe we'll take you down to 300, 250. Keep doing your research, but you know, you're, you're not done. If you think about it as an efficiency in the system, if people's labs are continually losing their funding for several years, and then maybe some of them restarting again, that's an enormous inefficiency. Right? Restarting a lab after a hiatus, huge inefficiency in the system. So increasing efficiency again is one of the goals of this. Now, we had a lot of debate. Should we have this only for people who are already established investigators in the R01 system, or should we also let new early stage investigators come into this? Okay, a lot of debate back and forth. The community, when we put out a request for information, was split on this. One of the good things about being director, occasionally I can make an executive decision, okay? So I made an executive decision. We were letting new investigators into this because I think it's gonna be as good for them as it is for established. And I wanna provide a path, going back to John's points at the beginning, to get new investigators into a stable funding mechanism so that they can really you know, use all that incredible creativity and energy that they have. So we're gonna let them in, but the trouble is, well, if the review is based on track record, it's not going to be a fair fight. And we recognize that. So what we're going to do is we're going to separate the reviews of the new investigators from the established investigators and have distinct criteria for the two groups. Okay? And so right away, that's actually, I think, better for the new investigators in the current system where they're all put into the same study sections using the same rules, more or less. So sometimes it's useful to define something by what it's not. And let me just tell you a few things that Mira is not, just to head off some anxiety. So this is not targeted specifically at high risk, high potential reward research. This is not the Pioneer Award. It has some of the same ideas, um, but it's, it's not just targeted at that. It's to be for all the research that IGMS traditionally funds. Okay? We hope that it will enable people to be more ambitious and creative, but it's not just targeted at that. It's also not targeted at a specifically uh, specifically at a perceived highly elite group. Again, we want to fund the great investigators, all of whom I think are elite, that NIGMS funds or could fund. We're not trying to recreate HHMI and skim just the cream off the crop. If this works, this experiment we're doing, we're going to expand it, hopefully eventually to be open to everyone that could apply to NIGMS based on their science. And it could become, I hope it will, become the dominant funding paradigm that the Institute uses to promote research. And that's where the big payoffs will come. That's where the big efficiencies will come, if that works. So that's the experiment. We've issued one targeted group, a uh, funding opportunity announcement for one group of established investigators. We're just finishing the new investigator one. If those pilots work based on evaluation, we're going to expand it. And again, hopefully it'll be open to everyone uh, as soon as we can have it. But I guess the floor is yours at this point.
So um, we've left enough time um, for individual questions. I hope you guys have been considering questions. Um, or And we really have, a obviously, a pretty experienced panel here to ask those questions. So um, any questions that, that, that came up during the discussion? Yes, let me, let me, uh, I want to make sure that everyone gets heard because this is being telecast, so. Uh, in your opinion, do you think that we're training too many PhD students? You want to start since you started? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, my own, my own view of this um, is that, that, that individual training programs have to look at the end product. They, they, certainly when we bring people in, we should be aware that there's going to be some attrition. So these are, this is kind of hard math to do because every graduate program I've been involved with, there's always a substantial rate of attrition. There's also the, 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 you know, the reality that, that you want people to be placed. A similar question is, uh, are we training too many postdocs? And these are all questions that every ethical PI in this room has confronted. I mean, I really think about every single postdoc that comes into my training program, can this work for them? And I won't take them if I think it can't. And I'm going to let John and, and John talk about that. So uh, you can keep this for like that. Sorry. Um, that is, I should all those hard problems. That is one of the hardest problems I've thought about since, you know, I've been thinking about this issue even before I got here. There is not a good answer because we don't really have enough data for one thing. You know, John showed that ASCB chart of where everyone's going, but there's a lot of squishiness in there. So we know unemployment's quite low amongst life sciences PhDs, um, five, you know, up to five years out. But beyond that, it becomes pretty murky. And those are the kinds of things you'd like to know, right? Is are people getting the not just getting jobs, but getting the jobs they want or, or are happy with, and that use their PhDs in appropriate ways? Um, the really hard thing about your question, though, is it's really asking us to predict the future on a very long time scale. So what, what we do now, we're not going to really know for 20 years if it was the right thing or not, right, or at least 10 years. Um, everything could change one way or another in that time period. So what I think is really important is, is to make sure students coming into graduate school have the information, like John said. If they know current outcomes, the likelihood of going one path versus another, then they should make the decision. Um, if we make it for them, uh, A, we may lose some really great talent who could go on to do great things because we may make the wrong decision. Um, and we could end up hamstringing the nation down the road if we make it the wrong way, one, one way or the other. So, I would answer that question in a slightly different way. I would say, we need to worry about the kind of PhDs that are being produced. So in my area here, I think there's a huge deficiency in mathematicians and in chemists and um, people who are agile at data science, managing big data, doing, uh, you know, how do you harness society's impressions into uh, crowdsourcing to answer questions? And maybe that's a little different than what our traditional PhD programs have been all about. When I look internationally and look at what's happening in places like China and India, where they're producing enormous numbers of engineers and people like I just described, it's very different, I think, than what we're producing. And I think that's a real threat to the United States and into the favored economic situation that we've been in for generations, I, I think it's something to really worry about. It's interesting, when I go to China, and I've been there quite a bit in the last few years, and I've spoken to some of the leaders, including the Minister of Health there, and I said, what's your biggest problem? And he said, well, we have two big problems. The first big problem is that we lack um, imagination, which he says, you guys are good at that. We can copy anything you do, but we can't create. So they're working on that. And of course, the other thing he said is, um, is uh, fraud and abuse. Yeah, thank you so much. I think both have given a perspective of the clinical centers and then looking at the future, I think it's great. 
I, I just have an, I love creativity and different way of looking at it. And I think it's great um, innovation in terms of what you're proposing for new researchers. But a few things I kind of like in back of my mind. One of them is, um, first of all, usually when you, when you have new investigators and senior investigators, they, they benefit from each other, one from the creativity, the other one from the experience. And, and separating these, um, and I know Dr. Dr. Galen talked about picking your, 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 um, your uh, precept of your mentor as well, but, but I, I see that as a disadvantage. It's, it's, it's one of the things, in, when you separate both of these, um, the creativity, not that the old folks don't have creativity, but that, that new energy that you have with the young investigators. And, and the other one um, that also is like, how, how, will you, how will you balance it in terms of balancing, as you say, you're separating, which I was I, I were like ready to raise my hand. I'm glad you, you um, raised it, that you will be uh, judging them differently uh, for, for those obvious reasons that you mentioned. But how will you balance into how many of one or the other will be best? And so just, I, I would love to hear some about that. So just to be clear, we're, we're separating the review process. They, they could still collaborate and be together, mm -hmm. and what, you know, we're not saying they can't talk to, to the, the more established scientists at all. It's just the review process. Um, the second part is an excellent question. How do we decide how many new investigators we want coming into the system every year? Um, the answer to that is harder to get, right? But we can't even deal with it in the current system very effectively because it's all grant-based. And this is one of the reasons I think switching to a investigator-based metric of funding makes sense. Because once you do that, you can say, okay, what's our overall pool of investigators that we can support? Then you can decide based on you know, whatever modeling or data you have, what the income uh, incoming new investigators should be, which is your question. And that then sets what the exit rate needs to be to balance that or what the redistribution within the pool needs to be. Um, in the current grant system, these things are disconnected, so it's very hard to have any control over it. Um, so this is actually mostly for Dr. Lorsch, but anyone can please um, chime in. <clears throat> so I'm interested in, in the amount of money that's left over in trying to find ways to redistribute. I actually have uh, colleagues who are turning down positions at kind of middle-level state medical universities because of this trend to require more and more soft money for your salary. Um, is that ever something that's being discussed? There's been this trickling down of the top medical schools into good, but, but middle-level uh, medical universities at the state level? That's being discussed a lot, um, that exact issue. The soft money positions that, you know, you show the budget yeah. doubling. This is really the result of the budget doubling, was that when there's a huge influx of funds coming to the system, it became a very easy way for particularly medical schools to expand their faculty by saying, you know, we'll hire you, but you get your salary. Um, now that things have become much tighter, it's clear that that's a bubble that's bursting. Um, so what can the NIH do about it? We could just overnight say, sorry, you can only put 50% or whatever salary on grants. Um, that would probably, if we did it, suddenly be catastrophic because there are all these medical schools that have faculty that would then have no way to support them. So what's being talked about is something more phased in. That we, you know, say, and this came from the advisory committee, the director's workforce report that Sally Rocky and Shirley Tillman chaired a couple of years ago. Um, something phased in where the target was set. We said over the next X number of years, um, we're going to ramp it down so that by whatever date, there's this limit of the amount of salary you can put on a grant, um, so that at least they have time to plan. But the, I think there is pretty broad agreement that the current system that you talk about is not sustainable. Uh, let's see, who be who? Um, no. um, thank you all. Um, I had a quick question about, um, just given how the landscape of uh, biomedical science is changing, and we talked about the incorporation of more molecular and genomic methods, um, I was curious just how you guys think training of medical students or graduate students will change. And particularly, I know that medical schools are now adopting curricula, which incorporate more of these uh, topics. But specifically, I feel like MD PhD programs are still very distinct in that there's an MD component, and then you go off to grad, grad school, and then you come back. And I was just curious if there's any thoughts about 
more integration down the road in yeah. light of how the landscape is changing? So that's a great question, and that's something we've talked about at Institute Directors. Uh, what to do about the person who gets pursues the MD, PhD program, spends a chunk of years in uh, a basic lab, then goes on the clinical rotation, and then goes into their internship and residency, spends four or five years out of science, and is suddenly expected to go back. And they got to start over. So how do you fix that? And uh, one of the thoughts is to create a way to have a continuum of research throughout that whole experience. And one of the obstacles to that continuum today is that universities don't allow people who are not on the faculty to apply for grants. And so a way to fix that is to say that people very early in their career path can become a faculty member, a junior faculty member, but be allowed to apply for NIH funding or funding from some other source and to thereby uh, preserve that continuum. So it's really an important question. Uh, you know, the average age of a new R01 grantee for a physician scientist is what, about 45? 40, yep, that's right. 44, 45. 45. I mean, you know, you've usually done your Nobel Prize work before that. So uh, it's a broken system. It's got to be fixed. Hi. Thank you. Um, my question goes to the impact of grants and going further with that. Um, so I'm, this is a topic I'm interested in, and I'm wondering, I mean, there's downstream things beyond citations, and um, you know, then we go to patents, and then from patents we go to drug sales, and you know, do these drugs, if they're drugs or procedures or whatever, do they have an impact on patient care and improve outcomes? And, and I know that gets really messy, so I'm guessing you haven't gone all the way to that level, but have you seen, at least at the patent level, have you looked at that and seen if that diminishing returns is consistent with that as well? That's a hard, we have looked at it, but it's hard to do because it's very science area dependent. Some, you know, some areas, because they're technology, for instance, focused, throw off a lot more patents than other areas that are really very basic science and the patents are more rare. Um, the thing that dogs all of these kinds of things that you alluded to is, you know, basic science, we're creating a foundation. It's a very complicated web of knowledge. And to figure out which strands were critically important for the eventual discovery um, is difficult. And, you know, if you pulled it out, would that discovery have been delayed 10 years? It's not a question you could ask. Um, so, you know, but you're right. There are longer term outcomes that should be investigated. Um, but of course, that takes longer term. We're going to take yeah. one more question. And then, then, uh, can, I, can I just yeah. add something on that? The, to me, it, it raises an interesting question of what should NIH be supporting when we talk about doing research that impacts health? Uh, we're always talking, and I've spoken about molecular advances, new drugs, devices, et cetera, that you pay more money for. You never see anybody at NIH, at least I haven't, talking about a grant that would fund building a $5,000 MRI machine instead of a $3 million MRI machine, or doing things that would consciously lower the cost of health care, which everybody says, you know, is going to kill the country, uh, the cost of health care. So sometimes maybe we should step back and think through what does the country really need? What does society need in terms of the output of science, and is the money being put, is the t emphasis being put in the right place, or should we be a little broader in our thinking? Hi. Um, you mentioned that you think that uh, biology and medicine should become more kind of math and chemistry oriented, or we should be training more people like that. Um, I'm wondering, what is NIH doing to kind of further those goals? Um, as I mean, my undergrad is in math and chemistry, um, but none of my math friends were interested in biology or medicine at all. And a lot of the kind of my bio pre-med type friends thought that math was kind of not important if you wanted to go into medicine or biology. So one thing we're doing since, you know, we're so heavily invested in training programs at the graduate and undergraduate level is to start to push these programs to innovate in that space um, and to tell them that that's going to be ways in which they're judged. And the kinds of things I'm most excited about you know, going to what John said are 
these integrated science programs like they have at Princeton or at University of Richmond, where they teach the math, the computer science, right there along with the biology um, and the chemistry and the physics in chunks, right? So that you're not having to take a whole semester of math, which is divorced from its application in biology or chemistry. I, I'd like to see that expanded and also go into the graduate curricula as well to get at exactly what John was talking about. One of the things that has excited me in traveling around the country is going to a program that Stanford has that they, I think they call Project X, where they have an engineering student partnered with a medical student early in their career path, and they send them into the hospital, and they say, look around, talk to people, and come up with some innovative project yep. that will make a difference. And it's amazing what these young people have accomplished. Uh, as students, uh, new artificial knees for, you know, like hundreds of dollars. Uh, it, it, that kind of thinking of bringing people together as teams very early, uh, whether it's a mathematician or an engineer or a data scientist, to teach uh, team science or, but just by interaction, I think is something that should be done more. So um, I don't want to keep people past the appointed hour. I know we're going to have, and I know I can speak for myself, I'll be happy to hang around. Uh, and talk to people for uh, some time to come, but to get people out of here. We've had one request from the audience for the microphone for one minute, and I, I'm going to uh, turn it over here. I, I wanted to take a moment to thank Wynn Arias um, for this terrific course. Um, we began every session with an image of the Brooklyn Bridge in process. One couldn't make the journey all the way across. Um, and so the question is, have we crossed the Brooklyn Bridge? And what Wynn never told us was that um, when they built the bridge, they put vaults in the anchorage of the bridge, and they put wine there. And the wine kept at a 60-degree temperature consistently. Um, uh, so that, that's one advantage of that bridge. Uh, and my feeling is that Have they gone back to drink it? <laughs> they, they, they actually rented out the vaults for storage wine, and that's how they paid for the bridge. No, but I mean, is it still there? Yeah, I, I think so. <laughs> I <don't know. laughs> So, so my feeling is that we did cross the bridge one way, and next year we'll have to cross it back. And we crossed it in our journey, which took us from attention deficit hyperactive activity disorder to dengue fever, immunotoxins for the treatment of cancer, Ebola, TB, ROS, a cancer mechanism and target, marijuana, malaria, mitochondria, alcohol, vision, bladder cancer, infertility, sickle cell anemia, glycoprotein diseases, and today, the future for biomedical scientists. It's been an exhilarating journey as we move from bench science to clinical treatment, from basic science to its application. And we've delved into this complex material with the help of those who've been patients, with experts in the fields, and in language of clarity. It's been an inspiring journey. Every week when I left this course, I thought about the condition of the world and, and the constructive work that we witness here at NIH. And, and I thought how much better this world would be if, if all of those, um, if, the, if, if all of us did work that benefited humankind the way the work is done here. Um, I'd like on behalf of all of us here and of those who listen and watch from afar to thank Wynn Arias for putting together this remarkable course and guiding and teaching us all. Okay, um, thank you all, and we'll sort of break the, the break into more informal sessions. If you want to come up and ask individual questions, uh, we may be able to hang around for a little while.